Amen. Before I go further, uh, tomorrow there will be Bible study, and hopefully we will finish the book of Galatians. The week after that, if we are to have Bible study, uh, one of the elders will have to volunteer to lead it. I'll still be in Alabama in two weeks. But tomorrow will be Bible study. Amen? Amen. I hope to see as many of you all as are able to attend. Uh, because after we finish our study on Galatians, uh, we're going to begin a study on the work of the Holy Spirit. So y'all might want to come and, and see what I've dug up out of the whole counsel of God and God's dealing with us by his spirit. Amen? Amen. I don't read many poems to you all in sermons. I, I don't fancy myself a poet or anything like that. But I saw one this week that struck me, and so I thought I'd share it with you. It's called, How Often? And after that, I want to preach on the subject, God has spoken. Let the church say, Amen. How often, how often we trust each other, but only doubt our Lord. We take the word of mortals, yet distrust his word. But oh, what light and glory would shine o'er all our days. if We always would remember God means just what he said. Pray with me. Blessed Lord. You have given us all holy scriptures for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart. By the patience and comfort of your holy word, we might embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, both now and forever. Amen. You know who John or Jesus said in just before the passage that we read in today's gospel reading, verse 47, whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Now, people ask why some Christians get their prayers answered. Some churches experience phenomenal growth. Some preachers have explosive impacts. Well, actually, it's mostly those people who aren't having those experiences either ask that question or try to ignore it by saying, well, it isn't real. The people that are having those experiences are too busy thanking God for them to ask why they're having them at that time. Then, of course, somebody will write a book later and try to systematize it and make some money off of it and do, you know, uh, teaching things and people will come so that they can imitate it. But the reality is being a Christian means more than just believing in the existence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Being a Christian means believing that the triune God is your God, the God who is, in fact, for you. It isn't blind faith, and it's not an assumption to believe that the creator of the ends of the earth is, in fact, for you. When God's chosen people, Israel, became discouraged because of their subjugation to Babylon, God sent a word of encouragement to the words given by the Holy Spirit to the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 40, beginning in verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. In other words, God says to Israel, he addresses Israel both naturally and spiritually. He says, why do you say, liar? Why do you say supplanter? That's what the name Jacob means. Liar, supplanter, trickster, trickster. Why are you saying this? And then he, he addresses the spiritual Israel. And why do you think prince with God? 
the one who contended with God and prevailed, why do you say that my way is hidden from the Lord? You who have lied to yourself, lied to your friends, lied to your enemies, lied to everybody, why do you now lie and say your way is hidden? I've been watching over you when you were in your mama's womb. When you were struggling with your brother Esau to get out first, I was watching over you then. How can you say that then about me? And Israel, you who actually wrestled with me and prevailed, how do you say that my right is disregarded? He's God then continues, have you not known? Have you not heard? Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. No, the God who's watching over you, Israel, though you seem to know it not, he, he doesn't get tired. He doesn't take a vacation. You're not in your current situation because God got tired of protecting you. And yes, I know it seems bad right now, Israel, but the ways that of which God is working, you can't figure them out. You can't search them out. You can't deduce them from your present circumstances. No, that's not how you understand the ways of God. That's not how you get the understanding of the Almighty. You see, unlike men who give power to those who've already got it, unlike men who support those who already have it all together because everybody loves a winner, uh, your creator gives power to the faint. Uh, to him who has no might, he gives strength. You know, even you faint and become weary. Young men fall exhausted. So don't think that it was better for you when you were younger. Don't think that if you could be young again, oh, you would have taken care of this. Oh, if only I knew then what I knew now, my now would be better than it is today. Because even young folks come short. Even young folks stumble. Just because you're young doesn't mean you've got it all together. It just means that you're young and you might have some resources of which you do not yet know how to use them. By contrast, when you get older, you know what to do with what you got, if you got any wisdom. But nevertheless, sometimes we'll lie to ourselves and say, well, because I'm old now, I don't have the strength now. But God says, well, that's all right. As long as you don't lie to yourself and say that I'm dependent on my own resources, as long as you don't lie to yourself and say my wisdom is enough, my common sense will get me through. But if instead you say, Lord, I'm weak, but you are strong. Jesus, keep me from all harm. You're going to get somewhere then because the Lord gives strength to the weak. Yes, he does. Amen. Oh, you but then the spirit goes on. It says, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint because the Lord supplies what they need. Those who wait on the Lord find him to be a present help in trouble. Those who don't wait on the Lord wonder where he's at. So it's not presumptuous to say, by virtue of your baptism, you are no longer God's enemy. But now you're his beloved child. That's not presumptuous to say that, because that's what God says about you. And it's not the absence of trials or tribulation that marks you out as God's chosen. No, the only thing that marks that out is that God has declared it in his word. And he makes it so. God is the one that makes the claim in 1 Peter 3 and 18. For Christ also suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Say that to yourself right now. Jesus died for me. 
to bring me to God. Now, I don't know if you searched the scriptures lately, but have you ever seen one time when Jesus failed in anything that he set out to do? Did Jesus ever lay hands on somebody and they got worse? Did Jesus ever tell a demon to get out and the demon dug in deeper? So if Jesus says, I'm bringing you to the Father, where should you end up? Amen to Jesus. Hallelujah. Peter went on. He said, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. You see, back in the days of Noah, God was patient over his creation that he had made as he watched those children of Adam made in the image and likeness of God get worse and worse, more and more evil, more and more rebellious, and yet he was patient. He was patient as he saw that there was only one man that he could count on, only one man that worshipped him in the beauty of holiness. One family of whom it could be said that they knew that the Lord is my God. And so in his patience, he took that family. He told them, build an ark. He told them, gather the animals. And God was patient while they worked on that ark. I believe the Bible record has it that it took Noah a long time to build that ark. He didn't build that ark in a day. Now I bet while he was building that ark, people were coming and looking and they were asking why, they were asking what, and they were laughing at his foolishness until the day that the Lord shut up Noah and his family and those animals inside the ark. And then they said, oh, come on down, Moses. Come down, Noah. Come on out that boat. You ain't going nowhere until the rain started to fall. And then they said, oh, this is an interesting thing. This must be what they call a shower of blessing. And it was for Noah and his family. And then Peter goes on to say baptism. Somebody say baptism. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Now it is the removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, dirt gets back on your body. In fact, your body turns to dirt, for dust thou art, and to dust you shall return. So no matter how many baths you take, dust is still coming up. I, I, I remember reading one time that basically it takes seven years and at the close of which every last skin cell on the surface of your body is new. Every last one of your red blood cells is new. Your white blood cells too. In fact, the only cells that don't regenerate like that is in your brain. But there's something about the request for a good conscience, the appeal for a good conscience, that in baptism, you are appealing to God for a good conscience. And as I recall, it was Jesus who said, ask and it shall be what? Given you. So there's nobody who goes down under that holy fountain, nobody who hears the words that accompany that blessed water that is a sacrament that does not receive that for which he appeared. That's why we can say with confidence, because God's word declares, God's strong word declares that you are in God's favor, because he said that those of you who have been baptized, don't you know all of us were baptized into his death? You see, think about it for a minute, saints. God united you with Christ in his lowest moment. In his worst situation, you were united with Christ. So if you were with Christ 
in his death. If you are united with Christ at his work, what are you in his highest? What are you when God exalts him and raises him up and places him at the name of us, every name, seeks him at his right hand? Where are you united with Christ? Because the Bible says we're seated with him in heavenly places. Amen. I know this might not look like heavenly places to you. The carpet's not made of gold. Neither are the streets outside. This don't look like a city that's four square. But God says it. His word says that's where you are right now. And by faith, I receive it. If somebody asks me, who am I a citizen of? I can say I live in these United States, but I've got dual citizenship. I've got another home, a place not made with hands. When I look at this place, I see a place made with hands. I see a place that's nice. I see a place that God blessed with all kinds of richness. Why, we can grow something and it springs up. But I also see a place with problems. I see a place where not every act of stewardship is good stewardship. I see a community where not everybody is on one accord, but guess what? I've got another place, a place not made with hands, a place where not only is there fertility, not only is there blessing, but there is no cursing. Not only is there joy, but there is no sorrow. Not only is there life, but it's life abundantly. That's my home. That's where I dwell. That's where there's a place reserved for me. And for you is that, can I get a witness? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. But yet, we wonder sometimes why God doesn't move for us. The way we think he moved for Dr. Luther or Charles Wesley or Charles Mason or even Norman Brand. Why didn't God do for me what he did for them? Well, do we pray like they pray? Do we seek the Lord like they sought the Lord? Do we trust him like they did? I don't know. For one thing, I wasn't there. I certainly wasn't there for Dr. Luther. I wasn't there for Charles Wesley. Wasn't even there for Mason. I know I look pretty old, but. And I wasn't here under Pastor Brand. I don't know what they were like. All I know is what I see in here. They might have had some good days. They might have had some hills to climb too. I know you've had some good days. I know you've had some hills to climb. I know you know that song, I Won't Complain. I know some of y'all have sung that you were climbing up the rough side of the mountain. I know you said sometimes, Lord, how long? When will my change come? And all I can say in response is, God's strong word promises that your change is coming. You know, it's not that God makes our way hard. It's not that God is a liar. In fact, to tell the truth, it's us who make our way hard. We make our way hard by not trusting in him. We make ministry hard by not leaning on the Lord. We make the way of the Lord darkness rather than light and dwelling in it. Jesus didn't cast away his bride. It's just that we don't listen sometimes to our groom. Uh-huh. Now, when you say, for example, that, well, you need money to have a successful ministry, you're calling Jesus a liar. Because Jesus said, we've received everything we need. Second Peter 1, 3, and 4 tells us his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has been granted to us his precious and very great promises 
so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Do you know that you are a partaker in the divine nature? Do, do you understand that when God calls you his child, he's not just using a play on words, a figure of speech. God has actually planted the Holy Spirit inside of you, and now you're no longer your own. Paul could say, I am dead, and the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, amen, to Jesus. That's what the Lord did for you when he died, when he went down to his lowest and bounded you to himself right there, so that when he got up, he'd take you up too, amen. Oh, yes, 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 you don't need money. When we what we need to fulfill our divine purpose is the same thing that the apostles needed, the same thing that the 70 needed, same thing that every other Christian congregation needs, same thing, the power of the Holy Spirit. And the thing is, quiet as it's kept, and it's kept pretty quiet, you know, in some of our Houses of worship. <laughs> That's exactly what the Lord gives to us when we're united with Christ, grafted into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. That's why we confess, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, because that's what the Holy Spirit does. Oh, I know he does a lot of other things too, but he always does those things. It's the Holy Spirit that makes the church holy. It's the Holy Spirit that identifies the church as Christian. It's the Holy Spirit that creates the communion of saints. I know some of y'all wouldn't like me in the flesh. I remember when I was in school, I wasn't, the, I wasn't the, 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 the head guy in charge. I didn't have a fan club when I was a kid. And it didn't change when I grew up. I had some friends, but I also had some people that didn't like me. I've stepped into churches and not everybody was singing my praises. So I know it ain't nothing but the Lord that makes my way prosperous in the Lord. I know it ain't nothing but the Lord that makes this ministry have power. I know it ain't nothing but Jesus that makes this word life giving. It ain't none of me, it's all of he. And guess what? He's no respecter of persons. The same God that used me, used you. The same God that gave me the little bit of wisdom I got. All of it's his, ain't none of it mine. He give that same strength to you. I know I went to seminary, but let me tell you something. Seminary won't give you power. Seminary won't give you peace. God's word gives you that. And you don't need to spend four years to know God's word. It's just nice to go to. It means that you know that you called me and that I've been trained. But it don't mean that I'm saved and you not. I didn't save nobody through a four-year degree program. He saved them through the waters of baptism. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And so we confess what is true confess these things because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. He enables us to do all things, and so you know what, saints? We have no right, no right to say that we cannot when God says you can. We have no authority to say we are weak when God says be strong and courageous, we have no reason to say we are dead and have no hope. When Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, the one who lives and believes in me will never die. He said that to you, and not just you as an individual, he said that to his church. His church will not die. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Oh, it may pass from one generation to another so that generation can tell generation, let the name of the Lord be praised. Somebody will take my place behind this desk. 
somebody will sit in the seat where you're sitting. But the church of Jesus Christ will continue on until eternity because we are united to the one who is eternal. Amen. Oh, I could go on, but today is Communion Sunday. And I know Elder Williams got Bible study to teach, so let me close there. In the words of Donnie McClurkin, we all make mistakes, even the best of us. But it's not over. We fall down, but we get up. <laughs> We fall down, we get up, we fall down, but we get up, we fall down, but we get up, or a saint is just a sinner who fell down. But he didn't stop there and got up. Y'all, some of y'all might know that. Sing that with me one time. We fall down, but we get up. We fall down, but we get up. We fall down, but we get back up again. Or a saint is just a sinner who fell down and got up. You know, Proverbs 24 and 16 says, For the righteous fall seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in times of calamity. It's not that the righteous fall down and get back up again, but the wicked gets down and stays down because one is better. It's because the righteous trusts in the Lord. Do you trust him today? It's not that the wicked stumbles in times of calamity because his burdens are more heavily than the righteous, but it's because he doesn't trust in the power of the one who got back up from the grave. See, if I'm connected to him when he fell down, I'm connected to him when he gets up again. And so I've got to get back up again. I've got to trust in the Lord and let the church say, amen. So saints of God, get up. Get up and go. Get up and go and baptize. Get up and go and preach. Get up and go and serve. And let the peace of God that passes all understanding. Guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. But